Hello, my friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. It's a small church just a few miles from here, actually, in Lawrence, on the other side of Lawrence. And friends, I come out here to the rest area by the grace of God to preach to you the gospel of God, to tell you about Jesus Christ. I come out here to tell you about the Savior, the one who can save you from your sins. I'm here to warn you about the wrath which is to come, but to tell you the way of salvation. For, my friends, God has prepared the ark of salvation, Jesus Christ. He can save you from your sins. The Bible says He saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, for He lives to make intercession for them. And the text of Scripture I would like to look at this beautiful afternoon in July is Mark chapter 1. And it is the story of the cleansing of the leper. In Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 40, it says this, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and he said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Friends, this is a beautiful picture, a, a, a demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ to save. Not just to save from a, a physical illness, but the spiritual illness that we all have, the sin virus. Just a few years ago, it seems like, the world was in a, a tizzy, you could say, a, a terror to some effect over the AIDS virus. It was fresh and it was affecting a lot of people killing thousands and thousands of people. It had a high mortality rate. And friends, people were afraid of getting the AIDS virus. But I want to tell you, friends, that there has been a disease that people have been affected by since the earliest of days. That being the SIN virus, the SIN virus, and it's a spiritual disease. But it is more than just merely an illness, but it has killed all people, spiritually. The mortality rate of the SIN virus is 100%. Those who are sinners, those who are outside of Christ, which would be everybody, is by default dead in this disease. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 51 that in sin did his mother conceive him. In other words, we're not only sinners from birth, but from conception. From the moment of our, the beginning of our existence, we were in sin. And friends, this is not just for you. You're not just affected by this, but I myself am as well. All people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is exempt from this. No one is exempt from this disease. And friends, as a skillful physician does, I want to first tell you the diagnosis. But I want to then lay before you the cure of this disease. Friends, when you go to the doctor, perhaps they find you to have a, a horrible illness or perhaps something that's not that horrible but still it's an illness and you have to take medicine for or some sort of treatment. They're going to first begin to explain to you the diagnosis, tell you all the bad things that are wrong with you, but then they're going to lay before you the cure. And friends, I must do the same thing. I must tell you the bad news about your sin and the bad news about God's judgment and wrath so that I can tell you the good news about Jesus Christ. So that I can tell you the good news about what Christ came to do. That He came to die for sinners and to, to rise again on the third day. And friends, this is what I come out here to do. I don't come out to tell you anything else but Christ Jesus and Him crucified. I don't want you to die in your sins. I don't want you to die in this virus of sin. For you will lose your soul for it. Instead, friends, I want you to be cured. And I lay before you the treatment option, the only treatment option, and the only treatment option which has a 100% success rate. For as I quoted when I got out here, Jesus Christ saves those who draw near to God through Him. Now this text of Scripture lies in Mark chapter 1. This is the beginning of Mark's Gospel. And Jesus' ministry has just begun. In fact, in Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 15, Mark records Jesus having, say, uh, having said these words at the beginning of His ministry. 
He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus was preaching people to repent. He was telling people that they must turn from sin and turn to Him and believe the good news of God's saving grace in Christ. Friends, I'm out here to say the same things to you. To repent and to believe the gospel. Well, what is the gospel of grace? What is this good news that we must believe? Well, toward the end of the chapter of Mark 1, we find a beautiful picture of what the gospel is. Of what the gospel message is. In these three verses that I just read to you, verses 40 through 42, and we're going to see three things in this passage of Scripture. We're going to see the request of the leper. We're going to see the answer by our Lord Jesus. And then thirdly, we're going to see the result. The request, the answer, and the result. Let's look at the first one. The request. In verse 40, it says, And the leper came to Jesus, beseeching him. Friends, this leper, this wasn't just a small disease. This wasn't something minor. This was a major disease. In fact, in, in Israel, in Jesus' day, if you had this disease, you had to be an outcast of society. No one could touch you who did not have leprosy. If they did so, they were considered spiritually unclean. To be a leper was one of the worst things you could undergo. It was one of the worst things you could experience. And friends, what a beautiful picture that is of sin. That we are so filthy in sin, that we are so dead in sin that we cannot even approach that which is holy. We cannot approach the holy God of glory. My friends, God is pure and righteous. He is more pure than the most refined gold and precious stones on the earth. God is absolutely... God bless you, ma'am. God is absolutely perfect. And He cannot look upon sin. Sin cannot be in His presence. And so sinners cannot approach a holy God. Friends, you cannot approach God. I and myself outside of Christ cannot approach God. Because we have sinned. We have broken God's law. God has given us His law to obey. The covenant of works. But we break it daily. Friends, look at the commandments. Look at the law and see that you cannot keep it. For God Himself has said, You shall not lie. But how often do we find ourselves telling what we would call little fibs or little stories? See, we even try to cover our sin in those ways by changing its name or its title. We try to soften our iniquity by changing its appearance. But friends, it nonetheless takes, it nonetheless takes away from that reality that we have sinned against God. Another one that God gave, another commandment, and this is one that people commit so often and they never realize it. They never truly look at it for what it is. And that is idolatry. God says you shall not worship any other God. You cannot worship any other God but the Lord. But how often do we see people worshiping other gods? Now in America, really the idea of religion is not a popular idea anymore. So people really don't worship necessarily other gods in the sense of deities, but they worship other gods in the sense of materialism or sexual immorality and pleasure or food or clothing or cars or sports. These are the gods of the Americans. These are the gods that the Americans worship. These are the false gods of America. In fact, uh, my dad and I would used to joke sometimes we'd go on and watch television and we would see on TV a football game going on, especially in the fall. And the crowd would be going wild. The crowd would be going crazy. They were so excited to watch this, this football game. A bunch of grown men carry some pigskin down a pasture of grass. And we called that America's religion. And friends, it's so true. People worship so many other things besides the true God of Scripture. And in fact, those who claim to worship the God of Scripture oftentimes worship merely an idol. That is, that they begin to make their own God in their own minds. They say, well, my God doesn't send people to hell. My God's, God, my God's not a God of wrath and judgment. My God's a God of love and mercy. That's not the God of Scripture, friends. It is true that God is merciful and gracious. And in fact, it says in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love, but that never negates nor takes away from His holiness and His righteousness and His purity. That never takes away from His wrath and His hatred against sin. 
that never negates that reality. They are beautifully complementary. These truths about God complement one another and define one another. So we see idolatry in the hearts of men, which makes them unclean. A third one is sexual immorality. Our, our, our modern world is built around this. Sexual immorality. You can hardly even watch television without having some perverse sexual image put before you. Friends, this is our state of our nation and our culture. But it's always been the state of the heart of men. It's true that, that culture becomes more and more evil and it denigrates further. But friends, this has always been the state of sinners' hearts. This has always been where people have been before God, that they choose sexual morality rather than to serve God. They choose to lust and commit adultery and fornicate. Friends, God sees your sexual morality. He sees your internet browsing history. He sees the pornography which you watch. He sees the perverse thoughts that go through your mind. Friends, and the Bible says that those who are sexually moral will not enter the kingdom of God. They will not enter God's kingdom. Well, this is really bad news, friends. We're like the leper for sure. And that's only three commandments. I mean, I had seven more to go through. Perhaps you've heard of the Ten Commandments. That is God's law. There's seven more I could look at, friends. But it's clear that we are unclean like this leper. And no way to be healed. We have no way to heal ourselves of this disease, of this SIN virus, which we have been spiritually killed by. And therefore, because of our sin, the Bible says we are without hope. We're condemned to hell. Those who are outside of Christ are condemned to hell. They will be eternally lost, thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And friends, I don't want you to go here. I would not come out here. I mean, there are so many things that I could be doing with my afternoon. But I come out here because I care for your souls. I don't want you to die in your sins. I don't want you to lose that which cannot be regained once it is lost. For once you lose your soul, it's too late. There's no second chance. Friends, I want you to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. For the Bible says that the Gospel is the word of reconciliation. So we are without hope as this leper was. The text does not tell us, nor does it imply, how long this man had had this disease. But probably, as with most people in that day, he had had it for years. And so the text reads, And the leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, imploring him. He was pleading. Jesus is pleading with him. He was pleading with the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from his leprosy. It says, And falling on his knees before him, he took a, a posture of humility before the Lord Jesus. He falls on his knees. He falls on his knees, crying out for mercy. And friends, what a, what a beautiful picture that is of how your heart ought to be before God. That you ought to cry out to God, fall on your knees and cry out for salvation. Salvation from the SIN virus. And the text records, it says that he was saying this, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Friends, this profound statement spoken by the leper expressed his trust in the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. He clearly says, if you are willing, in other words, if you desire, O Lord, to save me, then you can do it. You can save me. Friends, if you want to be saved from your sins, if you do not want to go to hell, if you want to be reconciled to God, then cry out to God, if you are willing, you can save me. If you are willing, you can justify me. If you are willing, if you are willing, Lord, you can forgive me of my sins. And my friends, I can guarantee to you that God can forgive you of your sins if you cry out to Him. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Friends, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He might cleanse you of your sins. That you might be cleansed of a guilty conscience which you have before God. 
If you are willing, you can make me clean. He trusted in the power of Jesus Christ. And notice the reply. So that was the question. Here's the response. That was the request. Now here's Jesus' response in verse 41. It says, moved with compassion. Dear friends, it is true that God is a holy God and He has a vengeance against sinners. But the Bible says that He is moved to compassion when those people, when those sinners come to Him and cry out for mercy. If you come to Christ and you cry out for cleansing, the Bible says that He's moved with compassion. He's compassionate and gracious, abounding in loving kindness, the Bible says. In Exodus 34, it says those very words that God is abounding in loving kindness. He has riches of mercy and they are found in Jesus Christ exclusively. Now that's pretty interesting. It seems the greatest heresy in America today, or the, the, the greatest blasphemy, is to say that there is only one way of salvation. There's only one way to God. There's no other way but through Jesus Christ. Friends, there is only one way, one truth, and one life, and that's Christ. He is all and everything. Do not reject Christ, friends. Instead, be like the leper who trusted in Jesus' saving power. And it says he was moved in response with compassion. He was moved to be compassionate to that leper and to heal him. And it says, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Friends, Jesus Christ not only was simply moved with compassion, but he acted upon that compassion and stretched out his hand and cleansed this leper. He, he cleansed him of his leprosy. And it's so interesting because in Jesus' day, that was considered totally unacceptable to touch a leper. You'd be an outcast of society, but He touches the man and He cleanses him and He heals him. Friends, we are so filthy in sin and so much steeped in evil. We are haters of God and enemies of God. But God has found a way to save us. He has, he has brought about the way of salvation and sent Him into the world. Jesus Christ Christ has come to save sinners. In fact, in Luke 19.10 it says those very words, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why Jesus came, is to seek and to save those who were lost in their sins, who were steeped in sin. He came to free them from it. And he answers back and says, And he said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. That's the response of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, come to Christ. This is the response that God, that God will have to you coming to Christ. Cling to Him for salvation. Listen to the result in verse 42. Here's the result of what happened. The third thing, the result... Immediately, verse 42, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. The immediate reaction upon that leper's body to Jesus' is touching it was that he was cleansed of his leprosy. What a glorious picture of salvation. Friends, you cannot merit your own right standing before God. You cannot try to be good enough. You can't try and make yourself righteous. You cannot do any amount of religiosity, do any amount of penance or prayers or Bible reading or whatever to make yourselves right with God. You've got to come to Christ and that will be an immediate salvation. That's why the text reads that He immediately was healed. Immediately His leprosy left Him. Immediately was He cleansed. Was, her, was His filth taken away. And friends, this will happen to you as well if you come to Christ. He who believes in the Son will see life. Those who trust in Christ have life eternally. 
have eternal life. It will never pass away. That's why Jesus said in John 10 that He is the Good Shepherd and He lays down His life for the sheep. And praise God that He did that very thing. That Jesus laid down His life for sinners. Listen to the words of John chapter 3. And these are actually the words of Jesus Himself. He says in verse 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. That's ultimately the challenge that I lay before you today, friends. Are you going to believe on Christ? Are you going to come to Christ? Are you going to reject Him? Are you going to be like the leper who comes before Jesus and falls at His feet on His knees and cries out, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Or are you going to be prideful? Are you going to be self-righteous? And are you going to continue on in your hatred of God and your rejection of Him and therefore be eternally lost, be eternally damned in hell? The, the option is yours, friends. You're responsible for your souls. Flee to Christ. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. What is that name but the name of Jesus Christ? Acts 4.12 says, For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. But the name of Jesus Christ. That's the only name that you will be saved by. Friends, He is the way of salvation. Don't trust in yourselves. Don't trust in your riches. Don't trust in your standing in society. The Bible says that riches will not profit on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. You must have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. You must be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, friends. Or else lost forever. Friends, I challenge you, repent, believe the gospel. And for those of you perhaps who are Christians, preach the gospel. Live on the gospel day in and day out. Never stop preaching the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation for everyone who believes. Friends, the good news, Christ has come and He has, he has fulfilled God's law. He has fulfilled the law which we break daily. And then He laid down His life as a ransom, as a propitiatory sacrifice upon the cross. The Bible says that the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. Isaiah 53.10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him. Christ died on the cross bearing the wrath of God against the sins of God's people for all eternity. In those few short hours, the eternal judgment of God fell upon Christ instead of God's people. He died in the place of the church, in the place of Christians. He died in the place of sinners. This is the beauty of the Gospel message that God, instead of unleashing His fury and His wrath and His judgment upon us, unleashed it upon His only begotten Son. That God did that because of His great love with which He loved us. The Bible says, but God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But not only did He die, but He rose from the grave. He is alive today. He is alive today and will never die again. That's why He could say that He was the life. That's why He could say in John 11, 25, that I am the, rex the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. How could he say such a thing? Because he is the resurrection and the life. Because death could not hold him. Death could not hold my Lord. And therefore myself and all Christians have this assurance that we will be raised. 
that on the last day when Christ returns, we will be raised with Him, and the Bible says we will meet Him together in the air. He has risen, and He will never die again. Listen to the words of 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 54 it says, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, this mortal body will have put on immorality, then will come about the saying that is written, O death, or excuse me, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll turn it down just a little bit. I'm going to have to bring the law out here, okay? So listen, this is my site, so turn it down just a little bit, okay? Is this public property? Sir, you need to turn it down just a little bit. No soliciting out here, no nothing. Oh, I'm not selling anything. Okay. So, I'm not selling anything. I'm not even handing out anything. Okay. So, I mean, if someone comes by, I might give them a gospel track. Yeah. But yeah. Sheriff told me about it. Is it but is this uh, is this public or is this private? Sorry, is it public or private? If it's private, I'll I'll leave. I didn't. Oh, great! Got the cops called on me. Dear friends, please come to Christ and have life eternally. Have life eternally. Christ is the, the Lord of glory. He is the God of all creation. In fact, the Bible says that if you repent and you believe on Christ, God will pardon your sins. God will cleanse you of your iniquities. God will wash you clean and you will be clean indeed. Friends, God will forgive you because Christ died for your sin if you trust in Him. And not only that, but God will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. You will be clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. You'll be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You'll be clothed in Christ's righteousness forever. See, my friends, the question is, are you trusting in your own righteousness? Are you trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in your own deeds or are you trusting in the deeds of Christ on your behalf? Which one are you trusting in, friends? Are you trusting in yourself or in Christ alone? Friends, I don't want you to perish. Even you who are young, the Bible says, remember the Lord in your youth. Friends, I love you and care for your souls. I would not come out here. It's July in South Carolina. And I'm standing out here. Friends, I care for you. I care for your souls. I don't want you to perish in hell. God says for whoever comes to Him through Christ will have eternal life. Heaven's gates are open wide for those who come to God through Jesus Christ. For those who come to God through Him. This is the hope of eternal life for all of the elect, for all of the people of God. And for those of you, my friends, who would claim to be followers of Christ, but you live in denial of that very reality by your actions, friends, I call you as well to repent. There's a special place in hell for hypocrites, for those who say they're Christians, for those who've walked the aisle, they've said the prayer, but they've denied Jesus by their actions. My friends, if, you're, if you claim to be a Christian, but you do not live like one, but you're a hypocrite, you were never one to begin with. I was like this for many years of my life. Lived in rebellion, drunkenness, pornography, idolatry, selfishness. I didn't care about the things of God. But God, by His mercy and grace, saved me from my sins. Saved me from my rebellion. Saved me from my iniquity. Friends, even you who are hypocrites, God can save you from your hypocrisy. You must be circumcised in the heart. God must do a heart transplant upon you. The heart of stone must be taken out and you must be given a heart of flesh. Friends, have you been born again? For if a man is not born again, God bless you, sir, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Friends, have you been born from above? Has God done the miracle of regeneration in your hearts? This is the question. And my friends, I pray that you have the correct answer. That your hope is in Christ alone. That in the words of the hymn, in Christ alone, 
I place my trust and find my glory in the cross. Friends, is Christ your all? Is He your everything? Is Christ precious to you? Is Christ everything to you? Or is He merely some teacher? Some nice man who once lived? Friends, Christ has to be your all, your everything. He must be your everything. So we've seen in Mark 1, verses 40 through 42, we saw the question that the leper asked Jesus, Jesus' response of his willingness to heal him, and then the result in verse 42 that He was so willing and He healed the man. Friends, be healed of your sin through Jesus Christ. My God can save you. Christ can save you, my friends. Be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Be reconciled to God through Him and for Him and for His glory. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. It says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God and listen to these precious words of verse 21. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Friends, come to Christ and live eternally. Thank you. Praise the Lord. All right, so I have to switch.